Well, brothers and sisters, we are continuing in the book of Ephesians, Paul's letter to the Christians in Ephesus, and we are looking uh, at uh, chapter 5, verses 15 to 20. Just a, a little paragraph that we have, but uh, like, like we've said many times, uh, Paul packs so much into a very small space, and so we will look at this for a moment and learn more still about how we are called to live our lives together as the body of Christ. And, and Paul here gets to something that is very close to the heart of the gospel and how it transforms our lives. So listen uh, carefully as we talk about being careful. Uh, listen carefully to the word of the Lord. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Amen. Well, today's passage may be short and sweet, but it packs a big punch in a lot of ways. Be very careful then how you live. Now, this is referring a little bit to the, the little poem just before this in verse 14, where Paul says, this is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. We were those sleepers, and we have been called to wake up and Christ has shone on us. That is why we are called to be very careful then how we live. Not careful because we are afraid that we are going to lose our salvation, but careful as in conscientious, careful as in wise, right? This is why Paul goes on immediately to say, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. Now, this is absolutely key to understanding how the gospel transforms our lives. And it is so hard because it is so contrary to the way that we want to live. In our, in our nature, we want to have the list with the check boxes that we can check off and say, there, did it done good made it right we want to have the rules we want to have things nice and neat and tidy and black and white we want it all to be in a nice neat little package that we can accomplish or we can judge people for not accomplishing we want to be able to look at someone and say yeah you're good yeah, oh, you're not so good, right? We want it to be clear. This is an age-long human problem, right? We, we have realized that something is wrong. And instead of using our brains and our hearts and our souls and the wisdom of God to figure out step by step in each particular instance how to move about our lives, in other words, how to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, instead of that, we want the list so that I don't have to think about it anymore. This tendency is rampant throughout the world. Why do you think there are so many laws on the books of every country under heaven? We want the rules. 
right? Why do you think the Pharisees were so tempted to figure out every little detail of obedience to the law? They want the rules. Why do you think we are tempted to do the same thing? What does it mean to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? Just give me the list and I'll do it all. Just like the rich young ruler. All these things I have done since I was a child. He wanted the check mark. He wanted the gold star. Without having to do the real work. But the reality is not that simple. A little while ago, I was talking with somebody uh, about the realities of parenting, and they said, well, it should just be like it was in the old days. If we were just able to go back to the old days, or remember, I had a, my parents had a stick, right? <laughs> he, he didn't say it. He didn't call it the beaten stick, but it was definitely the spanking stick. And, and, and Gwyneth's parents, um, they're wonderful, absolute people, absolutely fantastic people. But they had like a paint stick or something on it that said, uh, children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right or this is good. <laughs> and that's, that's what they used, right? And... and But it's not that simple. It, it, it's possible that if you lovingly and wisely employ discipline techniques from years gone past, that it will work and be great for your kid. And your kid will learn exactly what they need to learn and they will grow up in the way that God intends for them. It's also possible that those things will not connect with that kid. And things can escalate. And things can go into a terrible place where you're angry and the kid's angry and the kid is broken and messed up for years and years and years afterwards. Right? We all know this. Right? So many of us are parents. How many of us who were parents would say that we were perfect parents? I'm not putting my hand up, <laughs> right? Right? And those of you who think of your parents, because whether we are parents, we all had parents, how many of you would say that your parents were perfect? No. Because it's complicated. You don't parent simply by a set of rules. Hopefully, you parent with wisdom. Right? And, and, and this is what Paul is getting at. He is getting at the reality of God's relationship with us is that in the beginning, there was like one simple rule. There was the rule of don't eat from the tree of life and don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and we'll be good. Right? Right? That was the one rule you'd think not so hard. Adam and Eve probably could have gotten a gold star. Ah, day one, gold star, didn't eat from those trees. Good. What did we do with the rest of our life? Oh, well, we walked around, we talked with the animals, named some. We, did, you know, we had a walk and talk with God in the cool of the garden in the evening. You know, paradise, awesome, hooray. One rule. And they couldn't keep it. Right? Right from the beginning. We couldn't keep the one rule. And so the consequences became very clear, right? You can't keep that rule, you will die. Right? And, and God, in his wisdom, because he is God, and because he is wise, and because he is love, he didn't make them die instantaneously and wipe out the human race and start all over again with, with dinosaurs or something, maybe flip the order or whatever. I don't know. He didn't do that. Instead, in his wisdom, he had a plan that would lead through who knows how many centuries 
to the point where not only would he restore his creations into a relationship with them, but he would also adopt them as his children, make them co-heirs with his son Jesus Christ, and recreate everything so that there is no more crying or tears or sin or anything like that, and everything is better than it was in the beginning. That is wisdom and love. That is wisdom flowing out of love. And so when Paul goes on and says that we are to live as not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is, and then continues on, instead be filled, second part of verse 18, instead be filled with the Spirit. Paul is saying that that same wisdom that comes from God, that allows God to come up with a plan that moves heaven and earth literally to a brand new place where everything is better than it was in the garden, that same wisdom has come to live in you and in me. The wisdom of God that came up with the plan of sacrificing Jesus, a terrible price for the goal of everlasting life and, and, and adoption into the family of God, that same wisdom lives in you and in me. Of course, we don't have to use it. We can carry on looking for our check boxes, looking for the bare minimum, right? We can carry on looking for the easy way to go through. Just tell me what I have to do and what I have to not do, and then I will do those things or not do those things in appropriate measure, and hopefully when I get to the end, the balance scales will be good enough in my favor that I'll get through. Right? It's, like, it's like that saying that I sometimes use, only the mediocre are always at their best. Do we want to be mediocre? Just sort of get through by the skin of our teeth? Well, God says that's not good enough. There's no such thing as getting through by the skin of your teeth. It harkens back to the Egyptians and the Israelites. It's not that the Israelites were better, better behaved. It's not that they had more stars on their chart or more check boxes in their checks, checkbox, whatevers, more checks in their checkboxes. There we go. Egyptians and Israelites all together failed. The bar, perfection. An iota smaller than perfection, less than perfection, not good enough. If you want it to be simple, it's that simple. Not perfect, not good enough. So, we can't get there via checkboxes. We can't get there with gold stars. The only way to get there is through the wisdom provided by way of Jesus' salvation and given to us in the Holy Spirit. This is why Paul goes on, he says, <laughs> it seems a little bit weird, right? Like he says in verse 18, do not get drunk on wine which leads to debauchery. What, why is that there? Why doesn't he say, do not go stealing cars which leads to greediness? Why is it that particular thing that he puts in there? Why? Because 
that wine is something that we try and fill our hearts with. We try and fill our souls. We try and fill the void in our lives with. And, and it, it's getting filled instead with the Holy Spirit is like the positive example of what drunkenness should be. Uh, that sounds really weird. But listen. Right? Being filled with the Spirit. Remember on the day of Pentecost, right? Peter and the disciples, they were filled with the Spirit and they started speaking in tongues. And, and the people around them were like, wow, they're drunk. And then Peter says to them, no, it's only like 10 in the morning. We're not drunk. We're filled with the Spirit. Right? And that doesn't mean that every day you're going to walk around prophesying in tongues and healing people dramatically, miraculously, whatever. That's not what it means. But rather, it means don't fill your lives with drunkenness. Don't fill your lives with alcohol. Don't fill yourself with something that is a, a very poor counterfeit for being filled with the Holy Spirit. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God for the, fa the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus. See, that is, that is Paul describing what being filled with the Spirit is. And you can also include in that understanding what the Lord's will is in verse 17. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. The Lord's will is that you not be filled with drink, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that looks like these wonderful things. which leads us back to making the most of every, every opportunity. We need to understand what the Lord's will is. How do we understand what the Lord's will is? Give me some ideas as to how you understand what the Lord's will is. Honestly, hands is fine. Yes, the Bible. Amen, sister. Right? The Bible. The Bible is the primary way by which we know what the Lord's will is. We need to be wise in discerning the Bible. We don't look at the story of David and Bathsheba and say, ooh, the Lord's will must be go, going out looking for women bathing on rooftops, right? <laughs> ooh, no, not at all, right? You interpret the scriptures carefully, but in the scriptures you find wisdom and you find God's will. Good. What else? How else do we find out God's will? Don't be shy. Prayer, yeah, absolutely, prayer. You pray. Remember, prayer is not a one-way street. Often, it sounds like a one-way street <clears throat> when I'm praying, and probably when you are too. Lots of talking from me and lots of listening from God. Not so much listening from me. But that we can change. We can practice being still. And knowing that God is God. Right? We can practice that. Listening to God. And God speaks. Right? Any other ways that we can know God's will? Family and friends. Wise counselors. Those people who have been journeying in the Lord along with us or before us. Yeah. The history of our people. The Christian people, you know, there's bad examples in there, but there's also good examples. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else? Yeah, amen, sister. Songs and hymns and praise, right? One of the reasons that we love to get together is, is not because all of us have per perfect pitch and can read music notes and so on and so forth, but we do love to sing together. Why? Because our Lord deserves praise. Why? Because it teaches us, it reminds us, it is good, it encourages us, it strengthens us. Yeah. Any other ways? There, there are other ways. Sometimes there is prophecy, right? 
prophecy throughout the Old Testament. There's been lots of prophecy, sometimes dreams. Think of Joseph and some of his dreams, right? Um, those are maybe less common, more spectacular, but they do happen. Any others? <coughs> yeah, Christian writers study certain areas. There are so many great theologians and writers, right? Um, everybody from C.S. Lewis to Karl Barth to Irenaeus who lived in like the third century after Jesus, right? There are so many people who have written so many things. And, and again, not all of it is perfect, but with wisdom and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we can find awesome stuff in there. Right? We can also find out God's will as we move along in, in life. I was talking with somebody um, just the other day who was trying to discern what God's will was with regards to uh, where their children should go to school in the fall. And, and they were struggling with that decision. And they were afraid that they were going to do what was contrary to God's will unintentionally. Right? And I said to them, look, submit to God all that you do and all of your prayers and and listen to him and if he speaks and tells you what you should do good great if you don't hear from him then chances are that he's like you know what you decide it's okay i'll bless either decision that you make because god gives us that too There are so many ways for us to know and discern God's will. And in doing that and living our lives wisely, then we can take, make the most of every opportunity. Because the days are evil. Paul was saying this almost 2,000 years ago, but the days are evil today too. We are in that in-between phase where Christ has come and redeemed us and we are cleansed and whole and righteous before his throne, but we are not yet what we will be. And so too this world, this world is ruled over by Jesus. He has won the victory over death and sin and Satan. But this world is not yet what it will be. And in the meantime, we can see the evil around. We can see the evil of diseases rampaging across the globe. We can see the evil of wildfires and the creation groaning as if with the pangs of childbirth. We can see the, the evil of warlords and tyrants and, and, and so instead we live as wise making the most of every opportunity. Brothers and sisters, let us be those who encourage one another with music and psalms and singing and the things that build one another up. And let us be those who live as those who are wise. And let us be full of the Holy Spirit. Let us make the most of every opportunity. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we can see that the days are evil, O oh God. We can see that this world is full of strife and sorrow and brokenness and hurt and war and sin. But we can also see, shining above and through it all, your Son, Jesus, who brings salvation who offers the Passover, who offers new life to us and to all who will believe. Father, help us to encourage one another in your name. Help us to live as the wise and help us to make the most of every opportunity. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.